Just after 3.30 a.m. on the morning of June 20th, 1997, a husband and wife from the city of Sarasota, Florida, awoke to the sounds of frantic pounding at their front door. Understandably startled by the noise, the couple proceeded cautiously, only to become even more unsettled when they opened up and were met with a grisly sight. It was a middle-aged woman with a bruised and bloodied face who was desperately clutching at her throat. It was obvious that the woman was trying to communicate with them, though through her gasps for air, it was difficult to make out what she was saying. One thing was clear, though. She was in desperate need of help. The couple had just barely started to call 911, when a realization struck them like a bolt of lightning. This seriously injured woman was their 50-year-old neighbor, Jan Scott. She was almost unrecognizable due to the swelling to her face. When the neighbors got on the phone with 911 operators, they told them that Jan was barely able to speak, but what little information they had been able to glean from her was terrifying. Though she had managed to escape, her 76-year-old boyfriend Henry was still back at the house, and whoever had done this to her might still be in there with him. When police arrived at the scene, they would make a truly chilling discovery. It was the beginning of an investigation that would baffle detectives at every turn, appearing to make less and less sense the more that they uncovered. That was, until by complete chance, an unlikely missing piece started to unravel the mystery, revealing a horrifying truth that no one saw coming. Jan Scott and Henry Keneva didn't have what most people would consider to be the classic love story. By the time they met in 1991, Jan was in her mid-40s and Henry was at the tail end of his 60s, and both of them had had prior other relationships and marriages and were the parents of adult children. Classic love story or not, though, the couple's relationship was nonetheless genuine and extremely loving. They had met when Jan went to buy a car, and Henry happened to be her salesman at the local Toyota dealership where he worked. Despite their considerable age difference, the pair quickly hit it off. They went out several times, and before long, Henry moved into Jan's home, located on St. Louis Avenue in southern Sarasota. For the next few years, the couple lived a quiet, albeit happy life. Both continued to work, even as Henry got well into his 70s. He liked his job at the car dealership and was popular amongst his co-workers. Jan, meanwhile, worked at a Hallmark card shop at the local mall. Even though they could have afforded to live more extravagantly, Jan and Henry were content with the simple things in life. This was particularly true of Henry, who had managed to amass a net worth of nearly $700,000, but spent little money on himself and only continued to add to his savings. Jan was similarly minded. She was perfectly fine, as long as they were together. Henry was caring, he was a good cook, and most importantly, he made her laugh. His sense of humor was what she loved about him most of all. With all of this going for them, it seemed like Jan and Henry were destined for many more years of happiness. Years that they planned to spend with their children, their grandchildren, and most of all, each other. Sadly, though, they had no idea that it was all about to come to a sudden and tragic end. When Jan and Henry went to bed on the night of June 19th, they had no reason to suspect that anything was out of the ordinary. They had puttered around the house as usual, doing their normal weekday routines, which ended with catching a bit of the 11 o'clock news. After turning in for the night, Jan got up once to let her dog Kissy outside to go to the bathroom, after which she returned to bed. At that point, Henry was still sleeping soundly beside her. Little did she know that it was the final moment of tranquility that they would ever experience together. Sometime after 3 a.m. that morning, Jan was jolted awake, only this time it wasn't by the dog. Instead, she felt a heavy pressure on her body and intense pain in her face and neck. Moments later, she blacked out. When Jan regained consciousness after several minutes, she had no idea what was going on, but she knew that she was in agony. She was also now lying on her bedroom floor, 
One of the first thoughts that occurred to her was that there was a terrible noise coming from the room. To her horror, she realized that this was the sound of her own intensely labored breathing. Aware that she was in desperate need of help, Jan tried to use the phone, but found that it was dead. Using what little strength she had left, she went over to her neighbor's house and pounded on their door. When police were called to the scene, they began a search of the property knowing that Henry was still unaccounted for and that whoever had attacked Jan could still be inside. Almost immediately, officers noticed that the back door to the residence was open and that there was no sign of forced entry. When they went inside, they found Jan's dog, who had also been hit and knocked unconscious, likely so that the animal wouldn't be able to alert the couple to an intruder. After a careful room-by-room -room check, police finally made their way to the master bedroom. Inside, they made a horrifying discovery. Henry was lying face up on the bed, motionless. There was blood on his face, and one of his own belts was cinched tightly around his neck. He had been beaten and strangled to death. While this was happening, Jan was rushed to a local hospital. It was here that the true extent of her injuries were revealed. Like Henry, Jan had been badly beaten and strangled, though it appeared that the perpetrator had used their hands rather than a belt. She had suffered bruises to a large portion of her body, required stitches to her face, and needed a breathing tube to be temporarily put in her throat because her trachea had been crushed. Fearing that whoever did this might try to attack again, police put Jan in the ICU under a different name and posted a 24-hour guard outside of her room. Even then, they were worried that due to the severity of Jan's injuries, they might lose their only witness to the brutal crime. However, Jan proved to be a fighter. When she woke up several hours later, she couldn't speak, though was able to write notes for detectives. She told them everything she knew, though unfortunately said that she remembered very little about the actual attack. Worse still, she never got a good look at the killer. Jan's primary concern, though, was Henry. Immediately after waking up, she asked how he was. When detectives delivered the awful news, she wrote back a single heartbreaking word. Why? It was a question that investigators themselves were grappling with at that very moment. One that they were beginning to realize had no easy answers. Back at the crime scene, authorities were busy trying to uncover whatever evidence they could find. While doing a search of the exterior of the residence, they quickly realized why Jan's phone had been dead. The lines had been cleanly cut, suggesting that a tool had been used and the perpetrator had specifically planned this ahead of time. A cigarette butt was also found outside and taken into evidence. The butt was dry, even though the grass underneath it was wet and it was a wet night meaning that it couldn't have been there for long. Detectives hoped that a DNA sample could be recovered, as given where the butt was found, the cigarette had likely been smoked by the killer. Inside the house, authorities found more potential clues. A small piece of thin rubber was found on the bedroom floor that looked to be the broken-off fingertip of a latex glove, which detectives once again hoped might garner usable DNA. The bedroom itself was chaotic, as drawers and other areas appeared to have been ransacked. While this last bit of information could have been seen as evidence that robbery was the motive behind the crime, subsequent discoveries cast doubt on this in the minds of investigators. In particular, Henry's wallet still had cash in it, and other clearly visible valuables in the house hadn't been touched. Instead, detectives started to lean more and more towards the theory that Jan and Henry had been the victims of a targeted attack. This not only explained why the perpetrator had left valuables at the scene, but also the level of planning that appeared to go into the crime. They had worn gloves to avoid leaving behind fingerprints and DNA, and had come prepared to cut the phone line so that Jan and Henry wouldn't be able to call for help. Police were especially convinced by the phone lines because they didn't think it would be something a burglar would do. Not only was it unnecessary, but there would have been a chance that cutting the lines would have triggered the home's alarm system if Jan and Henry had one. Investigators just didn't believe that a random burglar would take such a risk. 
This realization did get at another idea, though, which is that whoever had committed the terrible crime seemed to have a decent familiarity with the scene. They knew where they could gain access to the property without having to force their way inside, seemed to know the layout of the home, and appeared to anticipate potential hazards that could give them away, such as Jan's dog. By the way, the dog did survive. I'm just saying that because I know if I forget to mention it now, a bunch of people are going to get mad at me in the comments. Anyway, taking all of these facts into consideration, authorities were more convinced than ever that the attack on Jan and Henry was personal in nature. But if that were the case, who would have wanted them dead? And for what reason? It wasn't long before detectives stumbled across one that they thought was particularly compelling. While the cigarette butt and latex glove were quickly sent off for DNA testing, detectives knew it would likely be many months before any sort of results would become available to them. In the meantime, they started to dig into the why behind the crime and began trying to determine who might have been involved. Though having a surviving witness was an invaluable resource, Jan herself could only get the investigation so far. Her memory was still extremely hazy, and she had difficulty recalling many details about what had happened. Tragically, due to her injuries, she wasn't even able to attend Henry's funeral, and ended up going to stay with her sister after being released from the hospital so that she could assist with the lengthy recovery ahead. During initial interviews with detectives, Jan explained that neither she nor Henry had any enemies that she was aware of. However, this didn't seem to track with the evidence that had been found at the scene. The crime seemed incredibly personal. Perhaps then, police speculated, the attack wasn't about something that Jan or Henry had done, but something the perpetrator had wanted from them. That's when authorities learned about the sizable amount of money that Henry was sitting on. Money that more than a few people apparently knew he had. Among the first people investigators spoke to about this were Henry's adult children, Jeff and Sharon. However, it was quickly determined that their involvement in the crime was unlikely. Both of them lived in California, where Henry had once lived too when he was married to their mother, and both Jeff and Sharon were in California at the time the crime took place. What's more, upon learning of their father's murder, they almost immediately flew to Florida and offered to assist investigators in whatever way they could. This included providing DNA samples, fingerprints, and submitting to polygraph tests. Police next spoke to Jan's adult son, Dan. They reasoned that like Henry's children, he would have known about the large sum of money that he was sitting on, but unlike them, he lived close by and would have been familiar with the crime scene since it was his mother's house and he had been there many times. However, when detectives went to interview him at his apartment, things took an unexpected turn. While it was quickly discovered that Dan had a solid alibi for the night of the crime, he had been at work, something which was verified by both another employee and surveillance video footage. The same couldn't be said for Dan's roommate, Brent. The thing was, investigators weren't initially there to talk to Brent at all, but when they showed up at the apartment, he almost immediately started behaving strangely. He appeared angry that authorities were there at all, and was disruptive throughout Dan's questioning. This set off alarm bells for detectives, who ended up requesting he provide a DNA sample as well as Dan. The last major area of interest for police was the Toyota dealership where Henry worked for the past 15 years. Here, they were told by almost everyone that Henry was extremely well-liked, though there was one notable exception. Several people that authorities interviewed mentioned an ex-employee at the dealership named Mark. Detectives learned that Mark and Henry had butted heads on numerous occasions and did not like each other. Mark was also known to have a drug problem, something for which he had frequently gotten in trouble and had eventually led to his firing. Co-workers said he would work for a while to get a paycheck, then immediately disappear for a few days and blow the whole thing. After that, he would return and start the cycle over again. He was constantly in need of money, and it turned out that he had been fired from the dealership just a few days before Henry was murdered. Even more concerning, a couple of people told police that they had heard rumblings that Mark had recently been talking about how he, quote, needed to get a gun to take care of something. 
When police sat down with Mark and interviewed him, their suspicions only deepened when he proceeded to make a couple of bizarre and potentially incriminating statements. He revealed that he knew about Henry's amassed wealth, commenting that he, quote, had more money than God. Mark responded even more strangely to questions about the latex glove tip that had been found at the crime scene. He told investigators that he would make a good suspect because his sister was a nurse and as a result, he had plenty of access to those kinds of gloves. Still, Mark said he had nothing to do with the attack on Jan and Henry. A polygraph test he took was inconclusive, but like the other persons of interest in the case, he agreed to submit fingerprints and saliva so it could be tested against evidence at the scene. Roughly six weeks into the investigation, Jan had finally recovered enough to the point where she was able to sit down with detectives properly. After taking a good look at all of the crime scene photos, she was able to determine that actually, a couple of small items were missing from her bedroom. The most notable of these were some rings. However, these wouldn't have been expensive enough to justify the attack on their own. They were mostly of sentimental value, with at least one having been given to her by her ex-husband, Rose Scott, who had passed away from a heart attack many years earlier. As for Jan's memory, she still had few recollections about what had happened on the morning of the attack, but said she was willing to do whatever it took to try and identify Henry's killer. As a last-ditch effort to recover any potentially lost memories, she agreed to undergo hypnosis. Unfortunately, Jan was still unable to recall virtually anything related to the appearance of her attacker under hypnosis. However, she was able to unearth a couple of important new facts. For starters, Jan remembered that whoever had attacked her had been strong. When she had awoken during the beginning of the assault, she had felt someone on top of her pressing their knees into her thighs while simultaneously hitting her in the face. This person had then grabbed her head and forcefully twisted it back and forth in an apparent attempt to break her neck. When that failed, they grabbed her throat. Crucially, just before she passed out, she had heard someone in the room speak. She couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman but she had been able to make out what they said. Quote, that should do it. These words were not only extremely chilling, but they suggested something that authorities hadn't been aware of up until now. The person who had said this was obviously speaking to someone else in the room. It meant that they were looking for more than one attacker. Detectives had just barely started to wrap their heads around this when two more unexpected pieces were added to the puzzle. As detectives were working to clear the growing number of suspects in the case, they got word that one of the people they had interviewed was in the hospital. It turned out that Brent, Jan's son's roommate, had set their apartment on fire and cut his own throat with an X-Acto knife. Though he had survived the incident, he was seriously injured and burned. While authorities initially suspected Brent might have been trying to cover something up, upon digging further into the situation, they learned that he had been struggling with mental health issues for some time. It appeared that they had mistaken his odd behavior for something criminal, and now no longer suspected him of any involvement in the attacks on Henry and Jan. Not long after, Detectives were hit with another surprise revelation, this time from Henry's children, Jeff and Sharon. They said that actually, there was another member of their family that police hadn't fully explored, their half-brother, David. It turned out that in the years between leaving his wife in California and meeting Jan Scott in 1991, Henry had been involved with another woman with whom he had had a son named David. David was now 20 years old, lived in Florida, and worked for a local pest control company in Daytona Beach. Though Henry hadn't been around for most of David's life, it just so happened that the pair had recently reconnected and had started spending time together. In fact, they had gone to see a football game together on Father's Day, less than a week before Henry was murdered. As police learned more about David, there were a couple of things that stood out to them. He had been to Jan and Henry's house before, so he likely would have been familiar with the layout 
and there seemed to be a rivalry between him and Henry's other children about who was entitled to what in terms of their father's estate. In fact, David had been overheard at Henry's funeral, already making plans for his expected inheritance, saying that he wanted to use part of it to purchase a jet ski. Understandably, these details were compelling to detectives, who ever since learning of Henry's substantial wealth had theorized that this could have been the motive behind his murder. An FBI profiler brought in to assist with the case agreed, casting additional suspicion on David by saying he was the most likely suspect given his already strained relationship with Henry and the potential financial windfall offered by his death. However, once again, there was a problem. David had an alibi. His employer confirmed that he was at work on the day of the crime, and his girlfriend was able to account for his whereabouts for the rest of the night. Still, just like everyone else, David provided DNA and fingerprints to be matched against evidence at the scene. By this point, investigators were growing increasingly frustrated. It seemed like the list of potential suspects was growing more and more each day, but no clear answers were emerging. It was like they kept getting new pieces, but they belonged to completely different puzzles. Things only got more baffling when after several months detectives started to get results back from the evidence that they had sent away for DNA analysis. Right off the bat, the news wasn't great. No usable profile was able to be extracted from the latex glove fingertip. That meant that all of investigators' hopes hinged on the cigarette butt. Unfortunately, one by one, the names were crossed off the list. Jeff, Sharon, Dan, Brent, Mark, David, not a single one of them was a match. However, just when it seemed like detectives were at a complete dead end, an incredible stroke of luck would turn everything around. In December of 1997, roughly six months after Henry Keneva's murder, police were dispatched to an address on Rita Street, located in the community of Vamo, in central Sarasota County. Officers had been called there to respond to a domestic disturbance incident between a husband and wife. When police arrived at the scene, they spoke to the wife, 40-year-old Layla Whiteley, who initially said that her 39-year-old husband John had attacked her. She was in the middle of providing details about the assault to officers when John began to shout over to her. He yelled that she better not do this to him, or he would, quote, tell them about the rings. As soon as police heard this, they were intrigued. By this point, most of them knew about the ongoing investigation into the attacks on Henry and Jan, and a couple of them made the connection between what John was shouting and the rings that had been stolen from Jan Scott. This was especially interesting because no information about the missing rings had ever been disclosed to the public or reported in the media. However, when John and Layla realized that police had clued into what they were talking about, they refused to speak any further. Neither of them were arrested, but this information was handed over to detectives working the Henry Keneva case. After this unbelievable turn of events, investigators began looking further into John and Layla Whiteley. The more they uncovered, the more their suspicions were raised. For starters, John and Layla lived close to Jan's St. Louis Avenue home, only about four miles south, and they had lived even closer at the time the murder took place. Both of them were also smokers, meaning that either of them could have theoretically left behind a cigarette butt at the crime scene. John likewise had an extensive criminal history and was physically strong enough to have carried out the attacks. However, the biggest bombshell would come when investigators started digging into Layla's past. When they did, they discovered that she had been married several times and had gone by a bunch of different last names. One of those names was Scott. It turned out that she was the daughter of Rose Scott, meaning that Jan had been her stepmother. Upon learning this information, detectives put the couple under surveillance and were able to obtain discarded cigarette butts from them that they had left at a Denny's restaurant. The butts were sent away for testing, yielding results in March of 1998. Finally, 
police had a hit. DNA from John Whiteley was a match to the cigarette butt at the crime scene. While this was a major step for the investigation, it technically only proved that John had been outside Jan and Henry's home. If they were going to prove anything in court, detectives knew they needed more. They needed a confession. Luckily, they had an idea. The only problem is that it would require them to go all in on a risky plan. On November 24, 1998, John Whiteley was on his way to work when his car was swarmed by police officers. He was told that he was being placed under arrest for driving on a suspended license, though once he was brought to an interview room at a local police station, authorities revealed why he was really there. They knew that he was responsible for murdering Henry Caniva and attempting to murder Jan Scott. Detectives proceeded to bring in box after box of files, which they told John contained all of the evidence they had against him. As proof, they showed him the DNA results from the cigarette butt, fingerprints that they said had been recovered from inside the latex glove tip, and a composite sketch of the suspect, which looked identical to him. A few minutes into the interview, another group of detectives walked Lalo right by the door and into a separate room. Of course, this had all been set up this way on purpose. Everything from police swarming John's vehicle to them walking Layla by the room had been strategic. The boxes detectives had brought into the room were just case files from the investigation itself. They didn't necessarily have anything to do with John. And of the evidence they had shown him, only the DNA match was legitimate. The fingerprint they had shown him was his, but they already had that on file from his prior arrests. And the reason the composite looked so much like him was because it had literally been created by a sketch artist who used John's driver's license as the source material. All of it was designed to fool him into thinking that the case against him was overwhelming. Walking Layla by the room was the icing on the cake. It was meant to suggest that if John didn't talk, she probably would. It was all essentially a giant bluff, but it worked. Not long after, John cracked. John claimed that the entire crime was Layla's idea, and that he had never planned to be involved. At the last minute, though, he had gone to the crime scene, but only to see if Layla had actually gone through with it. That's why his cigarette butt was there. He said that when he went inside, Layla was already struggling with Jan, and that he only provided some assistance. He said that Layla was responsible for the actual attack and murder. As for the motive... John explained that Layla felt Jan Scott had inherited things when her father died that rightly belonged to her. This included the St. Louis Avenue home where the attack had taken place. It was actually the house that Layla had grown up in. Jan had received the house as part of her late husband's will, and it had made Layla furious. This is also why she had taken Jan's rings. She felt that they should have gone to her as well. Up until this point, Authorities had thought that Henry's money was the target the perpetrators were after. However, in actuality, the crime was motivated by Layla's mistaken belief that if something were to happen to Jan Scott, she would inherit her estate. It made the crime even more pointlessly tragic, because it wasn't even true. If Jan had been killed, everything would have gone to her son, Dan. With this bombshell of a confession in hand, authorities went to confront Layla. She pointed the finger in the complete opposite direction, saying that John was the person truly responsible. She said that John brought the wire cutters that had been used on the phone lines, and that it was his idea to use the belt to kill Henry. She said that when she struggled to attack Jan, John had taken over and tried to finish her off. Following Layla's confession, authorities charged both her and John with murder and attempted murder. Needless to say, when authorities told her the truth about what had happened to her and Henry, Jan was devastated. She had no idea that Layla was responsible and hadn't had so much as a conversation with her in years. Jan told police that she had tried to keep in touch with Layla after her father's death, and for a while they did, 
but one day she called her, only to find that her number had been disconnected. Since then, Layla had never reached out to her. As horrible as this was to wrap her head around, soon Jan was hit with another blow. Prosecutors approached her and Henry's children and told them that even with everything they had, they were worried about taking the case against the Whiteleys to court. They feared that if John and Layla got in front of a jury and pointed the finger at each other, they wouldn't be able to successfully prove who was actually responsible for what. If that were the case, they ran the risk that the pair of them could walk. Instead, prosecutors proposed the idea of offering John and Layla a plea deal. Jan and Henry's children agonized over this decision, but eventually came to the conclusion that guaranteed prison time was better than the risk of two killers going free. As a result, John and Layla were each sentenced to 20 years in prison, plus five years of probation. At the sentencing hearing, Jan gave a harrowing victim impact statement recounting the horrific ways in which the crime had affected her life. She told John that he was an evil monster and said to Layla that she didn't hate her, but that her father would be appalled at what she turned out to be. If you're doing the math in your head, then you've likely already realized that given when all of this took place, John and Layla have since completed their sentences. This is true, though according to the most up-to-date records we could find, John is now back in prison, serving a five-year sentence for aggravated battery intended to harm. Layla, meanwhile, was released from prison in 2015. We were unable to find any further information regarding her current whereabouts. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a minute to thank our amazing supporters over on Patreon. As many of you are aware, our situation on YouTube always seems to be a bit uncertain, but our patrons help to ensure that we can continue to make content like this long term without having to worry as much about what surprises might be thrown our way. Plus, patrons also get access to four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. If you'd like to help support the channel directly, head over to patreon.com slash crimezone to join. You can also find that link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and take care. <laughs>